uh, very retro. Huh? It's like, maybe some of y'all weren't born at that time. <laughs> so 1990s, um, that time, a uh, video camera handy cam just came out. So what we did was, uh, the human rights or the activists, we said, okay, because really that time, it was all TV, any professional cameras, big, you know, big budget. But when handy cams came out, we thought it was a, a tool for activism. So we kind of used it to the max. Lah. But very, very little training or capacity, etc. But this is now like very valuable footage which uh, we have started to archive uh, into like, we call it um, a keep film rakyat, you know? And I think these footages next time, if there's a lot of young filmmakers here, we could use it, revisit, you know, these communities and make a new video. But this footage we made available for anybody who wants to use it. Lah. So, okay, for this um, session, uh, we are happy again to have uh, two people. One person is uh, Anne Surindran. Uh, he was part of the, he was much younger then, right? But I think almost the same. Yeah, he, he was a part of the fact-finding mission. <laughs> now all got white, white, uh, <laughs> beruban. She just said I was retro. You know? <laughs> <laughs> yeah. And then uh, the other person, of course, is Gap. Uh, Gap, who we, uh, was part of session one. Yeah. So, um, do you all have questions about the... Uh, I think just make it open a bit. Uh, maybe any questions about Bakun and the dam first or not? Ada tak macam soalan uh, tentang isu Bakun tadi? You roughly you know what happened, right? Uh, yeah. Huh? Sorry, can I ask? Okay. Yes. Uh, do, you, do you know anything? Uh, sekarang ni dekat Sungai Asap tu macam mana? Uh, tapi saya, saya jawab. Ah, uh, okay. Can. <laughs> Uh, roughly, actually, I was going to go into uh, fact finding uh, what happened before, but Naman, I think you can yeah, do that. Go ahead. Uh, okay, uh, saya menjawab sebagai orang Sarawak dan aktivis daripada Belaga, tempat di mana Sungai Asap ni. Okay. Uh, keadaan tak banyak berubah. Uh, malah masalah yang 25 tahun yang lampau masih wujud sampai sekarang. Contoh dia masalah tanah janji demi janji nak tambah tanah tapi tak tertunai termasuk dua-dua dah uh, retire lah bekas ketua menteri Sarawak uh, Tun Taib dan uh, bekas PM kita Datuk Seri Najib dua-dua uh, janjilah dekat penduduk asap masa uh, campaign election eh. tapi tak tertunai dan masalah air bersih masih lagi berterusan Uh, selalu ya tiba-tiba uh, air kuning tiba-tiba uh, air tak ada sampai dua hari tiga hari masih berterusan sampai sekarang dan mereka yang menyedihkan sekarang di dikelilingi oleh ladang sawit berskala besar maksudnya untuk company dan ini menimbulkan masalah sosial yang sangat serius uh, itu yaitu masalah dadah Ya, saya ni sekarang ni zaman moden kita ada WhatsApp group dan kita di orang belaga kita ada WhatsApp group juga. Hari-hari kita boleh baca rintihan, keluhan, masalah dadah ni tak selesai. Report polis pun macam apa orang kata menyimbah air di atas daun keladi. Ada satu ketika komuniti sendiri yang bertindak menyerang, tangkap orang yang disaki jual dadah, pusar ni. Sebab polis tak buat apa-apa. Hari ini, kalaupun mereka tangkap, tangkap, masuk lokap, sekejap, keluarlah. Yang ini tak pernah sampai di atas, benda macam ni. Ha, ini masalah kat kami kat Sarawak. Okey, itu dululah. Masih. Uh, just, uh, juga, I, I mean, when I see this, reflect tentang uh, empangan nenggiri kan? Yang the second session just now, in Kelantan. It's never changed and it's going to happen. The same things will happen to indigenous people if they are displaced, you know. We had a video about the Nangiri, kan? So, it's like a broken record, no? <laughs> you know, uh, yeah, so that's, that's my reflection, lah. Yeah, um, anybody else uh, have any questions? Yeah.
I, I just want to add um, to what um, Gab said, actually. Um, this is just an observation. Um, so I was in the Bakun area in 2015, working on a microhydro, on a report, a video report on the microhydro, community microhydro systems. <laughs> and one of the funny things I saw, ni dekat Mudung Abun, dekat 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 dengan Asap juga ya. Um, so kampung Mudung Abun ni, belah kiri pylon elektrik dari Murum, belah kanan pylon elektrik dari Bakun. Tapi kampung tak ada elektrik. <laughs> yeah. So so things like this. I mean, yeah. Yeah, so I, I just wanted to tell this story. Like I find it extremely hilarious and ironic at that time. Yeah. So uh, maybe Surin, uh, tell us a bit about going back to that time, the journey. How did you feel, and now seeing it again? Right. Right. Uh, Salam sejahtera and uh, good afternoon to everyone. I am um, and thanks to uh, FFN and uh, um, Ilham for organizing this. Thanks very much to Anna who uh, invited me to come this this uh, this afternoon. I am very glad to be here because uh, there are not so many people in this room, but I think this is very important. It's very important not just because of um, what happened then, but because this is a continuing problem. 24 years ago we were there, and what happened then, the injustice that was done, the problems uh, into which the people, the indigenous peoples of that area were plunged into suddenly, when they decided to build that dam, it continues until today. And if you're talking about 24 years, you're talking about a generation's, a generation's uh, difficulties and sufferings uh, that, you know, that were caused by this whole Bakun Dam affair. Um, and uh, why, why did we go there, you know? Saya, um, I think that time, 98, 99, issue Bakun ni issue it was a big controversy. It was a not just national controversy, a regional controversy already. So more orang tahu pasal isu Bakun Dam. Dan kalau kita nak um, uh, buat sesuatu, we need facts. We needed the facts. Of course, the other account daripada uh, apa tu daripada uh, uh, orang di kawasan itu ada newspaper report dan sebagainya. Tapi tak ada satu laporan jelas yang independen mengenai apa yang berlaku. So, and kalau kita tak ada fakta dan kita cakap, nanti dia kata kita cakap kosong. Siapa? Kerajaan lah. Kerajaan, state authority, kalau kita tak ada fakta, dia kata kita cakap kosong. Kalau kita cakap kosong, dia kata, okay, kita ambil tindakan atas kamu. Okay? Ha? Session 500, kanun keseksaan, fitnah. Atau Session 233, Huh? Communication and Multimedia Act ataupun Section 4, Akta Sultan Sekarang pun sama juga kan huh? Kalau kita kata sesuatu Kalau kita buat komplain Kalau orang biasa buat komplain Reaksi uh, Immediate daripada Pihak berkuasa adalah Kalau tak betul kita akan lapor, Buat laporan polis terhadap Kamu okay? So what do you need? You need facts So we went, we went into the facts and um, uh, it's been a long time, 24 years, but uh, what I recall very clearly is the attitude of the officials. Um, you know, that we, we saw the video just now. Now I remember that gentleman. I rem I <laughs> in the Kapit District Council, I remember the gentleman. What the video doesn't show, the video is a very short excerpt of what actually happened. Um, but that gentleman first from the word go, he was a bit sulky. He started answering a few questions. And uh, I think Kwa was doing most of the questioning. But the more questions we asked, the less we were getting. So eventually, Dr. Kwa started asking more and more harder questions. And the ge gentleman gave shorter and shorter and shorter answers. The longer we questioned him, the answers became shorter. Eventually, he got so fed up, he got up out of the room and walked out and left me and Kwa sitting there looking at each other. <laughs> so I think that part of it didn't come out in the in the video. But that illustrates um, 
you know, the the I mean, can you imagine Kwa is a former member of parliament? I'm a you know a, a lawyer activist coming there to question and they it's so difficult for us to get the information out. So one can imagine the difficulties that the um people in that area faced uh, uh when 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 they were directed by the by the authorities to just pack up um you know and and just walk out of that area leaving everything that they had done uh, and I recall I recall the, the, the state of the house I mean you've seen it, I don't want to repeat it. But it was terrible. I remember the people going up the, the staircase and you'd get splinters in your hands. Can you imagine? And they've all got kids, kids running around. But you can't go up without getting splinters in your hands. They didn't even plane the wood, you know. The wood was just just left like that. And they were charging 52k for that. Can you imagine? That was 1999, right? Even when you're going on property prices then, 52k is a lot. may not be so much now. And that's what they were giving people for 52k each, you know. Um, and um, it, was a, it was a good team. I mean, there was there was Kwa, very 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 pushy, and you know he knew how to put them on the on the defensive, you know. Uh, and, and eventually we got that in, in important piece of news out that there was no certificate of fitness. Can you imagine here? This is huge project by the government. Bakun Dam project, they were removing all these people and they were the, the state itself was removing them to habitation which was actually illegal to occupy. You know, so you, you, you have got a situation where the state is carrying out illegal, illegal acts and uh, not ordinary people doing it, but the state doing it. Houses without CF, kids running around, this is the kind of this is the kind of um, uh, thing that was going on in Baku. And the whole area, the, the resettlement area, looked like some kind of a squatter, squatter area. You know, it was messy, it was dirty. There was, it looked like uh, rubbish everywhere. And I know there were problems with the sewage. Um, the I mean, you can see it from the photos. But but I think being there, um, it, it really brought it to you. So you're like wondering, how does this happen, right? How do you, how do you uh, how does how do, how can such a thing happen considering that the amount of money that is being spent to build that that dam is billions is billions so if it's billions and there are private corporations involved in this who's making the money who's making this money so it's like a pyramid right so the so the, 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 the land that has been taken away from them is worth so much because they're now turning it into a dam which is going to generate money and then the contracts are going to be given to build that dam which is worth huge amounts. So the money, the, the, the profits then multiply and multiply and multiply to huge amounts as it goes up. Goes up to where? Rich, corporate, fat cats, you name it. Chaps in government who make money out of it under counter here, under counter there. Come on, we know this story, right? And there were people reaping millions, what, billions eventually? I don't know. And all this, so that, you know, they, they, they could just, they could just, um, uh, uh, I, I guess they're still making money now out of the whole thing, you know, and more people making out of it, money out of it. And the, and the strange thing is this, they could have given them more. Because they were making so much money, what, what's this business of building a what five thousand ringgit worth long house and selling it each unit for fifty two thousand? I mean, how stingy can you get? You are making millions, you are making billions, and this is the best that you can come up with. So, and from what our friend here says, Gabriel, they're still there, and then there there, there are people in Sungai Asap. He's from Long Longgawin, yeah? Long. Uh, uh. Okay, okay. Tapi sekarang. Ah, so, I mean, and and according to him, I mean, I didn't know what's the latest, but um, all those people who were, you know, moved to Sungai Asap are still there. So this is this is what happened then, and those were the demands that we made at the end of that um, fact-finding mission. And clearly, zero of the demands were ever met by the authorities. I think, I think it, it came out in the media. I think we made few attempts to push the authorities. 
but zero of the of the of the requests or demands were met and as a consequence the people are still in that situation they only got 3 acres so existence is not great and the most important thing is they were entitled to more because you know they had a much bigger uh, area much bigger land in which to live with they were entitled to much more and for the past 24 years they stuck in that same place so what happens now and why is that happening because the government of Sarawak the federal government the government in Putrajaya both of them do not care they don't give a damn and that's why ASAP is like that that's why none of these people got anything because none of them care they only care about making sure that their corporate allies and others make money out of the whole scheme and also I suppose the most uh, responsible would be the Sarawak government, right? Who, who's going to touch them, right? Because they're now allies with the, um, uh, with the, with the uh, administration in the, fe in the federal government. So, but I, I, I don't think we should be, but anyway, I suppose, I suppose we'll, co we'll come to what we're going to do about, uh, you know, the situation later. But uh, I, I, I don't think we should be hopeless. I think it's great that that um, as Anna says, this, this, you know, th th this, that this film has been unearthed. Uh, we don't hear much about what's, what's been happening with the people in the Bakun area these days. There's, there's no news about it, but, but they're suffering. So I think it's, it's great that this has come out and, um, and, and hopefully, you know, s something better can come out of this. Right? Thanks. Yeah, I mean, the one thing that I really, the Surin said that caught me is like, how did we let this happen? And I don't think it's just the government, you know, or any government. It's also us, you know. It's like, how do we let this happen, you know? Uh, it was big news. Uh, as in, uh, it was a really big effort by, I think it was a coalition of NGOs, one of the most big things that we've ever done as a group. We even brought the mothers from the Bakun. I think around eight or ten of them came all the way to KL. <laughs> We'll go through the Sungai and no fly, first time flying. Come to the parliament to tell the members of parliament, we don't want the dam. If you think, uh, you know, uh, we want the dam, we are coming to tell you that we don't want the dam. You know? Um, so, we, I think everything that, that could have been done was done at that time. And still, uh, yeah, so somehow I didn't listen, just... Um, yeah, and actually it still continues. La. But I think, um, I think now it's different a bit because that time we could not show this anywhere. There was before internet, no? So we actually duplicated video and then send, 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 you know? And then uh, press statements that we made and all this, uh, if the news TV didn't record us, it's not there. But of course times are different now, yeah? So maybe we could think of doing more things and making issues like GAPS issue, Nangiri's issue, even asking what's happening in Sungai Asap now. There's a lot of things that we can do, I feel. It's just that sometimes we let it fly past us, you know. Fly past us, I was thinking, uh, sorry, now I'm like giving story, I'm not the story person, but no, we are 10,000. You said 10,000 was affected in Bakun. 10,000 is the number that we hear that uh, is uh, died in Palestine. And we are like, you know, don't know what kind of, uh, you know, a very, very big reaction for Palestine. Our own people, 10,000, 20 over years ago, tak ada pun orang yang buat bising sangat, no? I think that's what we need to also reflect. Lah. That's what I'm reflecting. I was a young girl when it happened, you know? And oh my God, to see it again, I think we, sh we can do more. I think young people can do more with the internet. We can do more. Yeah, and I think we should maybe even support, um, you know, uh, struggles of our our friends and uh, our fellow activists in Sarawak uh, more. Lah. Yeah, um, but um, yeah, how to do it? <laughs> Any ideas, Turin or Gap? <laughs> what can we do with an issue like, uh, yeah? Okay, kalau uh, Bakun, saya nak cadangkanlah hmm. uh, untuk hantar lagi satu pasukan macam yang uh, 24 years ago 
hmm. yang dia orang Suren buat hantar lagi satu pasukan untuk after 24 years apa ha, itu yang public kena tahu sebab so, propaganda GPS ni uh, minta maaf ya saya bukan nak kutuk GPS ini kenyataan mereka is, uh, government of the day di Sarawak semua tanggungjawab kena mereka kita uh, tolaklah dekat, dekat mereka so apa yang mereka cakap tu lain daripada apa yang sebenarnya berlaku dan banyak masalah sekarang ni termasuk konflik di antara orang kampung Ha, saya sempat sebut sikit dengan saudara Suren tadi berbuah sini. So bila tanah tiga eka tak cukup, apa mereka nak buat? Ada yang berani dan yang nakal ni dia ceroboh tanah sebelah. Sedangkan tu tanah orang lain, kampung lain, so tercetus masalah. GPS tak peduli, dia tak peduli. Yang yang bermasalah rakyat dan bagi pihak kerajaan dia senang menolak. Benda ni Oh itu sudah anda PL company lain Dia kata So Satu masalah jadi dua ha. Benda macam ni tidak pernah dilaporkan Konflik Dengan orang kampung Dan company kata Bukan kampung tu punya Ini sudah dalam dia punya PL PL bermaksud provisionalist Pajakan sementara Untuk kelapa sawit Diberikan oleh kerajaan negeri kepada company Selama 60 tahun banyak masalah macam ni sudah timbul sekarang Dan Baru-baru ni uh, Dulu bila Mungkin untuk menyejukkan keadaan Orang kampung, kemarahan orang kampung uh, Kerajaan Bawa satu uh, stesen MPOB Set up satu stesen MPOB Di Belaga Kononnya penyelidikan Apa itu MPOB? Uh, Malaysian Palm Oil uh, Board lah Sebab mereka, penduduk di situ Yang resettle ni digalakkan menanam sawit di atas tanah tiga ekar ni. Okey, mereka tanam sawit. Pejabat MPOB di situ. Macam wayang kulit lah. Bukan mereka nak tolong betul-betul pun. Beberapa tahun lepas tu baru-baru ni kena cabut dah. Pejabat MPOB ni di yang dekat asap ni dia tutup, listemen asap tutup, dipindah ke tempat lain. Alasan dia tak tak clear sangat. So Takkan pembangunan yang macam ni pun mereka tak boleh bagi kepada rakyat Kalau mengambil kira pengorbanan yang 10,000 orang ni telah buat untuk Sarawak Sebab bakun dam sekarang sudah di, diambil alih oleh kerajaan negeri Sarawak Dulu dia milik uh, kementerian kewangan yang diperbadankan Sudah diambil alih oleh kerajaan negeri semasa uh, Tok Nan dulu dia ronding ambil balik Dan Elektrisiti ni ada yang dijual kat Kalimantan pula. Ha, tengok cerita kawan kita tadi si, situ. Kampung Mudong Abun ni tepi jalan tak jauh daripada asap. Kabel elektrik sebelah-sebelah ada. Tiba-tiba tak ada karan. Cuma sekarang ni dah disambung. Ha. Itu pun sebab mereka tahu takut kalah pilihan raya baru mereka bertindak. Dan kampung yang dihilir empangan bakun Selepas 10 tahun baru ada karan Baru sambung Sedangkan baku ni dia generate 2400 megawatt capacity Mengapa kampung bergelap di hilir bakun Karan ni untuk siapa Itu Inilah sikap kerajaan negeri Sarawak Dan semua masalah ni mereka tak peduli Sekarang mereka nak binat banyak dam lagi Target mereka 7,000 megawatt. Selalu ni keluar dekat local newspaper di Sarawak. Macam Borneo Post, Dayak Daily. Kita boleh baca tiap hari. Ini kerja gila mereka. <coughs> Sepatutnya mereka membangunkan Sarawak tu untuk kita lah. Untuk orang Sarawak. Bukan untuk poket mereka. Sekarang dah sign. Hari tu kalau tak silap. Mereka dah sign MOU dengan Singapura. Cadang nak jual elektrik pergi Singapura. Dah sign dah. Ha, kalau tak silap saya sebulan lepas Saya ada baca dekat paper Inilah semua sikap-sikap Pemimpin kami di Sarawak Kerajaan kami Dan seperti yang saya nak tambah juga Ramai dah penduduk Yang dipindahkan dulu Di BRS Asap 
dah kembali ke kampung asal. Mereka dah tak peduli dah. Kalau ikut undang-undang memang tak boleh. Salah. Tapi mereka tak boleh, tak peduli dah. Kalau tangkap tangkaplah. Ah, ha. balik buat kampung. Anak-anak sekolah kat Asap lah. Macam yang dalam video tadi, Sanganau. Kampung Sanganau semakin bertambah besar. Ini yang saya tahu. Mereka sekolah dekat satu tempat di Baleh di, disebut uh, Bukit Mabong. Tapi masalahnya, bila cuaca selalu hujan, jalan balak tu dulu terputus. Ha, di situlah kita kasihan sangat dengan mereka. Mereka sendiri yang kena repair jalan balak. Kalau jambatan yang terputus tu mereka tebang balak buat jambatan sendiri. Kerajaan negeri tak peduli. Sebab dia salahkan orang kampung yang tak nak berpindah. Ha, ini. Macam di Long Lawan ada ada bertuah sikit. Ha, masalah dia mereka tidak diberi hak milik tanah. Ha, dalam video tadi 24 tahun yang lepas 13 keluarga Enggan berpindah dari Longgang ke BRS Asap. So mereka ini yang berpindah ke Lawan, Sungai Lawan. Sekarang kampung mereka nama dia Long Lawan. Dulu 24 tahun yang lepas 13 family, sekarang 75 family. Uh, baru-baru ni saya pergi sana. Uh, ini yang mereka hadiahkan untuk saya juga lah. <laughs> Long Lawan. Uh, sekarang ni sebab pembinaan Murum Dam. Ada sekolah baru dibina tak jauh dari kampung mereka. Itu untuk uh, orang yang resettle akibat daripada murum dam. So mereka lebih dekat hantar anak sekolah sekarang. Tetapi tiada hak tak milik tanah. Cuma mereka ikut keberanian diri sendiri. Kompeni masuk halau. Kompeni masuk halau. Nah, itu saja. Uh, segi perundang- perundangan mereka tak ada hak. Okay. I just want to share. So, um, when the when the thing uh, when the when the bakun was happening, and then uh, everybody was resettled. There's this one group uh, activists, uh, and they're thinking what to do. So, people like uh, Gara, uh, some of the leaders that didn't want to resettle, they found uh, they went up river, right? They went Ulu, because they have land everywhere. So they just went up river, you know. Um, And um, this model actually uh, help uh, other communities that face a uh, dam or so. Uh, there was another dam in Sarawak. I cannot remember uh, what was it, but uh, he, we did another video. His name is Simo. <laughs> Siapa tu? Eh? Oh, Simo. Ah, huh? Uh, Simo. Bengor Dam. Ah. Bengo so there's another dam going to be built in uh, called the Bengor Dam. So the community there visited the Sungai Asap and also uh, people in uh, Lawen, you know, and they belajar and learn from these people. Oh, kalau you resettle, mungkin semua masalah ni akan terjadi. Uh, ni taktik lain tu naik atas kan, go up river. So uh, Simo actually went up river, and he brought his whole community there and is thriving. But same problems because when you go up river. That's not what the government wants you to do. They didn't get the facilities lah. So, clinic tak dapat, uh, you know, uh, all the teachers tak dapat, uh, check apa, uh, school pun tak dapat, macam tu lah. Yeah, but they all look much happier there lah. In a sense that, uh, <laughs> not all is not lost in the sense that, you know, um, there's still resistance. I felt there was resistance, a lot of resistance, and people who who move, They leave to tell the next group what to do better, you know. So I think that is something uh, that is important, you know. Sangat penting. Oh, kalau you rasa like you're the only one doing this, there's no reason. But that's 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 my inspiration lah. You have to mengorak langkah. <laughs> Just do something that you think is correct, you know. And uh, you know other people will follow lah. And that's the for me the bright spot lah. The other bright spot for me is um, documentation. It's so important, you know. Um, this all proof, you know. <laughs> Should take them to criminal court or something like that. I don't know, but it's all proof of what happened, you know. And like I said, now actually it's a very good idea. Maybe some of the filmmakers here want to take up, you know. 
we find money and go for another trip to Sungai Asap and find what happened. Anybody wants to, wants to uh, volunteer? <laughs> that can be done. Yeah? You mean just talk about it, lah, you know? What's, what, what's up, you know? People after 20 years, that could be one. But this documentation is very powerful. It's a testimony of what happened. I'm so glad, like uh, Surin and the rest went, and we got this video, you know? Uh, but it's also, it's also proof that nothing... We, we need better leaders, ah. <laughs> we need better leaders. And they need to be held accountable. Bagaimana mereka boleh buat sampai begini dan boleh lepas, I don't know. <laughs> you know, they're not accountable. And year after year, we keep voting this same leaders. Apa hal dengan kita? Eh? <laughs> you know? Bukan saja mereka, but where's our awareness lah, you know? I think as uh, young voters, uh, you know, we, we should be questioning that, you know, we are the ones that are putting our new leaders into power and what kind of leaders do we have? Yeah, I think, uh, yeah, I don't know what else to, uh, maybe Surin, you have a yeah, I think, uh, some suggestion? I, I think uh, what, what Gabriel said just now mm. about sending in another fact-finding mission to see what happened 24 years later, I think that's a very good idea. Mm. Um, in fact, it was running through my mind also. Uh, but of course, organizing it and all, <coughs> uh, it, it requires a certain amount of effort. But uh, the, the importance of it is because it's not, it's not like we are visiting some, some, some old experience yeah. or anything like that. <laughs> the, stuff, the, the, the problems continue. So, I, you know, I think if you can show the, the, the how there's been no difference and how, you know, the, the effect of what has happened probably has now rippled around. You know, another generation is affected and then another generation will be, will be affected. So I think that's, that's, that's quite important because one thing I can tell you is this, and most of you in the room are old. Um, those days we thought that um, right after this... Um, uh, sorry, I, I meant young. Young, ah. <laughs> yeah, I was like, you meant old or young? <laughs> yeah. Young, okay. The, the old is here. Yeah, like, yeah, you yeah. Know. <laughs> I thought maybe not Gabriel. So, so at, at that time, uh, when, when, you know, back in 98, 99, I mean, th th that was a very powerful government uh, in place, as we know. Um, and there, there was no such thing as, uh, what, Malaysia Kini and the internet and all that. It was, it was a very difficult fight. But at that time, I think we all thought that if we can change the government and put in people who believe in change, reform, the good people, we've got to put the good people in, then all these problems will get solved, including the problem of what hap what's happening now in Bakun and, and all the other problems we thought can be solved, we can just put the right people in government. Sadly, I think we were wrong lah, about that because we managed to, after that I went into politics, I was in parliament with some of the other members of the team, like uh, Dr. Kuma and all that. Um, and uh, we did change it. Um, but then after the change happened, nothing happened. None of the, none of the changes that we expected happened are, are happening now. For example, now, now the, 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 the problems that, that, that are happening in, on the ground in Sarawak, the new dams that are going to be built, the displacement that is going to that it is going to cause the current old problem in Bakun whose responsibility is this? Is the responsibility of the government that is in power now not the old government that is gone okay so the government that is in power how do we get them to do something how do we do it do you, is it by way of of going and reasoning with them and telling them that look what you are doing is wrong it's immoral it's sinful you are making people suffer. Can you please do the right thing so that everybody can live happily after? You think these politicians and these ministers and the government is going to listen to that? They don't listen to that kind of talk. For them, what is important is getting power and staying in power. Getting power and staying in power. So if you want to make them, if we, we, need, if we want change, we have to hit them where it hurts. In other words, the votes. If they are afraid of getting power, then we must say that we must, we must bring out the stories of what is happening now in Asap and in, the, in those areas and throw it out and highlight it and let the public know about it. Right now, even I was pretty much in the dark as to what is the current status of Sungai Asap because there's no news about it. Maybe there are small columns in the Borneo Post, but nobody in the peninsula, for example, knows about it. 
So how do we do that? We need people, we need activists, we need the young to go and start digging up the dirt, you know. And when that comes out, there's two things that they're worried about, I told you. They don't want to, they want to get power or if they're already in power, they don't want to lose power. If it affects that, then they'll start doing the right thing. And that's the only way to bring change. Embarrass them, attack them, make them fear that they'll lose power, make them fear that they look bad in the eyes of the voters who hold the, who hold the power over them, you see. And then you can bring about change. And this you can do. This one anyone can do. So if you're having the next fact-finding mission, uh, the 24th year fact-finding find, fact mission, I hope some of you will volunteer. <laughs> then we can all go down and try and fix this, uh, fix this situation. You know, so that I, I don't have to come back in another 24 years <laughs> from now <laughs> and talk about this. We'll be a bit old then. Yeah. Thank, thank, thank you, Serene. Yeah. Huh? Okay. Yeah. Who? You. Okay. Uh, thank you for that. Um, so, I'm, uh, for those who. Yeah, my name is Nadira. Uh, I'm a filmmaker from Sabah. Juga. Um, I have so much love for FFN, this story, the, you, all of you on stage for just, you know, sh doing what you do and caring about film equity. Uh, sepanjang hari ini yang saya tengok semua dokumentari uh, tentang empangan semua kan, saya uh, rasa lagi takut sebab saya sekarang ni I'm developing a documentary uh, in art installation about a dam in Sabah as well. Uh, the Papar Dam, the Kaiduan Dam, and to, um, it's a hard story because it's almost like the most, you know, tale as old as time kind of story, but I do have ideas on how this we can break the cycle, how the system can be broken. And uh, first of all, I think we need to understand exactly, because it's easy to do comparisons uh, of like, this is how you know Palest things got taken over in Palestine. This is what happened to Africa. They got affected by Western imperialism. Um, but we need to understand how oppression works and looks like in Malaysia. And the question that I always get from West Malaysians when I'm here is that Orang Sabah and Sarawak, why are you dumb enough to keep voting these people in power? Kenapa boleh ada tai bambu di sana untuk dua tiga dekad? And they don't understand the history of Ketuanan Melayu and how the federal government chooses the leaders in Borneo. How did Taib Mahmoud uh, stay there for so long? Because they are Milan now, and that's the closest thing they have to Malays over there. And it's also, apart from race politics, it's also money politics. It's also in Sabah, it's social engineering. They want to Melayukan orang asal di Sabah. They want to bawa macam ni, um, was this migrants from outside, and then take advantage of them. But the most important thing, at which, well, not most important thing, but I think maybe the most relevant thing today uh, uh, with this crowd, but also to me as a Borneo filmmaker, is the deliberate media blackout that was put on Borneo, that was put on the Orang Aslis as well, so that they can continue to oppress these groups uh, with impunity. So uh, they can do whatever they want to us, as long as we cannot speak back. And so the thing that I have been advocating for the longest time um, is that we need to have more Borneo and indigenous stories platformed um, in the mainstream and within the film scene as well. But again, there is so much resistance uh, towards that uh, in my own experience. And the thing is also, it's not just about, because if I want to talk about how each of us in the room can make a small difference in our own ways, is that one, take an interest in Borneo and indigenous stories, minority stories that are told by marginalized peoples themselves. So but I've spent my entire life, I've never gone to a cinema to see Orang Asli stories that have made by Orang Aslis. And I'm only starting to see now Borneo stories made by Borneans. It hurts because people think my pain is not real, as that my marginalization is not real. Dan saya bukan cakap macam oh, kita cuma kena um, tayangkan film yang ataupun dokumentari yang ini yang uh, kita boleh nampak macam orang asal tertindas. So, orang akan sentiasa fikir macam orang asal 
dan marginalization yang penindasan ini ialah satu yang kami tiada uh, humanity that we don't we are not three dimensional people dan and that's why i think that apakah apa kata wanita orang asli is so important sebab dia orang bukan saja membangkitkan isu yang political uh, dan um, tapi they they're funny and they're strong and you know um, their in, that in their enthusiasm is infectious and that soft power that soft power is important tapi kadang-kadang dengan macam programmer ataupun um, producer yang saya jumpa di sini di Kuala Lumpur dia orang tidak mau mening, apa ni mengangkatkan cerita begini sebab they feel that indigenous people don't look happy <laughs> In, indigenous people aren't supposed to hold technology or be able to use technology um but actually we have very full lives um and what i'm trying to get at is i think ffn does an amazing job at trying to promote media equity and i think that all of us in the room especially the students here if we can start thinking about the consumption of media in terms of media equity kalau kau boleh pilih antara satu cerita tentang orang asli ataupun orang borneo yang dicipta oleh community itu kalau kamu boleh pilih antara yang itu ataupun sebuah cerita tentang orang asli tentang orang borneo yang dicipta oleh orang luar cubalah kau menyokong you know like the productions the the stories that are actually made by people from those communities and um that's i think how we can start to make a difference in malaysia um yeah and work towards a more equitable society yeah yeah thank you mm. yeah i guess it's about uh i mean humanizing uh you know there's like uh, not just like you say uh native sarawak is always oppressed but they're just human lah right that's what you're saying yeah Yeah, so the, so oh, I, sorry, just one quick tip. Uh, so to get a film permit to shoot in Sarawak, I think uh, Anna, you might know a bit better. But to get a film permit to shoot in Semenanjung, you just have to apply SPP through Finas. But in Sabah and Sarawak, because of the logging, because of the dams, um, actually you have to get the film permit also from the chief minister's office. Mm -hmm. And what I heard is that in Sarawak, they, it's even harder because you will have to say which community you are filming and if they know that you are applying for the film permit to apply, to film the Penan community you will not be even a lot to go in the country. so this stuff so the relationship <laughs> between that oppression and media uh, who gets to tell the stories is real okay thank you yeah it's not a kind of censorship that we should uh, <coughs> highlight yeah but i just thought it was corruption i i, I know there's uh, the chief minister <laughs> thought it was just corruption but yes it's also censorship yeah uh it's also illegal huh? if, what they're doing yeah. which is to insist that the chief minister's office gives a permit for you to go out and uh, film the panan is actually illegal it's illegal in so many ways you know but obviously the problem is no one is going to i mean it's rawa right mm. yeah okay um okay last one yes uh, before you i just uh, just want to reiterate i think uh, what uh, nadira said I think there's one thing we can do, uh, amplify the stories that are, choose what you want to amplify, orang asli stories, uh, stories from the orang asal community themselves, or when you do, what kind of angle you're going to give, try and think a bit about it, you know, which angle has not been covered and should be covered, you know, so have that thought, uh, yeah, okay, uh, yeah, Lydia. Yeah, I just had a question about um, the uh, Bakun community um, internet access. Um, what is the internet access like, and how many people actually have a uh, handphone? Uh, yeah, internet access, no problem. Okay. <laughs> and plenty of them have their own uh, handphone there. Okay. Anna, this is... Um, <laughs> just put yeah. it up, is it? What's, what, what's the suggestion? So, I'm just bringing this up because you're asking this question about, you know, what can be done. Uh -huh. So, before the... 24-year anniversary expedition that, <laughs> which, 
you are volunteering for. Yeah. So um, I uh, during the pandemic, I made I made a documentary. It's hard to see all three of you at the same time. So during the pandemic, I made a documentary purely on handphone footage made by the characters in my documentary. Um, I didn't shoot a single thing. They shot it themselves through their own eyes, and they chose what was seen on, on the footage. So they chose it. And what they did was they just uploaded it to um, Google Drive, um, and then I downloaded it in KL. Um, and then my ed at that time during the pandemic, the lockdown, I couldn't even see my I couldn't even meet my editor. So then I shared the drive with my editor, and my editor downloaded the footage. I watched it. I put the script together. I put the thing together. I would and I would discuss with my editor. And my editor was I think he was in Kedah. My editor was in Kedah, and he cut the thing together. And then my my client was in Singapore. So the whole film was made completely remotely. So if there are people in these communities that have handphone that, you know, like I'm sure Anna Freedom Film Festival, like Shakira, all of us, we can give it, we can have a Zoom, or not Zoom call, but like even WhatsApp video and say, this is how you can shoot, hold the, f hold the camera steady. It's all the stuff that, like I did the same thing with the characters. I told them how to shoot it, what it should look like, um, how to make sure that you have clear audio. And if there are, if there are one or two individuals in each, uh, longhouse that can take these kinds of instructions and be able to shoot footage, we can piece a film together. I'd, it's, I did it. So if, as you said, internet access is no problem, <laughs> like, I think you can already make um, a, a documentary um, update for the 24 year anniversary of what's happening right now. You don't have to take the big camera, you don't have to, you can piece it together. Yep. Good idea. Yeah. Yeah. Okay, um, and one last one. Yeah. Who was it? I just want to also like first echo Lydia's point is that like the methods that you the methods that will make the next fact finding mission essentially is that right now because the the taking the I guess, quote unquote, the right way or the official way is hard. The, your power actually lies in, in re really the the guerrilla style. And right now, before the radar, before they pick, b before I guess the authorities pick up in the radar, what is actually being done is on this sort of like minor unofficial system, the pipeline. It can do a lot of, uh, it can do a lot of good, before they, they catch on. That's one. But secondly, um, I think the question of Derek is Surin because um, when you guys did the fact-finding mission 24 years ago, and I guess the question goes towards like people holding the camera and recording the camera. What was it, what were the considerations um, when you were holding the camera? Was it through a journalistic approach? Was it through a static approach? Um, because I think it's important, just as important for filmmakers now, because right now documentary there is the documentary that really. Um, portrays certain things, and then there are documentaries that documents with like almost a factual capital D, right? So, if a fact finding mission was to happen again, what would be the considerations will you give um, not just filmmakers but documentarians on how to frame um, these people? What would the uh, what were what were you considering when you were just holding that camera like 24 years ago? Is it more of just making sure everything is seen, or is there any other sort of tools or uh, rules that you abide by to create the the piece? Yeah. Okay, I, I probably I'm not the best member of the fact finding mission to answer this. The best person would have been Matthew, so I don't know where Matthew is now. Where is Matthew? Uh, I called him. Uh -huh. uh, yeah, he's still around. He's still around, huh? Yeah. Okay, but I'm glad. Not, 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 not okay, I'm, I'm, I'm glad. <laughs> I'm glad. But, but so I was, I was the lawyer on the team. Probably the least useful member of the team, lah, you know? But, but um, uh, I think what we wanted to do, when we discussed it, was that we wanted to, because our aim was that, so that we've got enough material to challenge the authorities on what they're doing to the people uh, in, in, the, in the Bakun area. 
So our main uh, purpose was to get the clear oral testimony down. So as I said, you can see a lot of it. I think there's probably a lot more footage that wasn't put into the, into the final thing. But it, it was to get that oral testimony in order to you know, make a clear supported case uh, uh, against what the what the authorities were uh, against what the authorities were were doing, you see, um, and uh, of course there, there, there are a lot of hurdles. For example, uh, you know, if you take out a camera in the district council and all that, you have to secretly. I think Matthew was secretly filming that part and all that, and he didn't get the good part where the guy stormed out of the. Oh, I, I wish he'd got that, you know, uh, but you know he, he didn't get the good parts and all that. So of course there were those those uh, constraints at all. But apart from that, I know I, uh, um, uh, I think essentially that was it, lah. You know, we just wanted to document it as, as as well as we could, so that we could make a case. It was more like a like a legal case rather than a right, rather than a you know filming thing. Uh, I'm producing a documentary kind of thing. We were, we, it was it was a case for the plaintiff kind of uh, kind of um, uh, 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 documentation. You know, that's how, I think that's how we saw it. Yeah, yeah. yeah, because sorry, uh, just to add up, because it's very, it's almost very um, like uh, a report slash anthropological study. It re really had an unbiased eye toward it, so it, there was some consideration to make it un as sort of like as objective as possible. Um, just wondering, like, if were to have another one, because if we say go to the personal route and have people send in the footages through WhatsApp, there, there, there is going to be those sort of like personal slash biasness that people could sort of fight against. And then rather that um, if the next bunch of people now with equipped with better cameras eh, and also equipped with a more command on film language, actually, which is precisely the problem. Because if you if you have so much command over like film language and say what what uh, um, how you frame something could mean changing the context of things, is it better now also to still maintain that objectivity when going into a fact finding mission like this? Like because when now things are evolved, right? So just wondering like um, is it does it still need the objectivity or does it do we need to go more in towards the I guess the feeling slash personal part of it. Yeah. It's just a question, right? Yeah. yeah. I, I think uh, personally for me, um, you can make many types of films. So if you want to hit the human angle, go ahead. It depends on your skill. But at that time, I think uh, capacity is very low. Just uh, one camera, shoot whatever's in front of you and whatever that you think is useful. And that was the, what we did uh, at that time. Lah. But I think for now, uh, yeah, I think it's multiple. So if you have a skill and you think this works and this, and you have a target audience in mind, go ahead. You know, I think we can do uh, different, different, uh, like what you say, it's more, most, most probably like uh, who's, who do you, who's, who's your target audience in mind that uh, needs to be considered. Uh, and yeah, so what I'm thinking is there's no right one way or, two or yeah, what way. Not, yeah. You know, so like if it's the... Fact-finding mission is going. I think objectivity and factual is good. But there's so many other ways to a hard light, comedy, la, you know, or, you know, uh, different types of ways. So I think all of it should be tried out. La. <laughs> yeah. Okay. Huh? Uh, yeah, Surin wants to form a committee. <laughs> Anybody Sorry. really oh. wants, please come and... Uh, <laughs> we can talk about it. Just that uh, the truth is, uh, there's a lot of other issues in the archive that we have. It's just that, uh, thank you to Chitu and uh, Ilham, he said, can you just pull out some indigenous and uh, environment issues and this is what we have. But there's a lot of other issues that needs to be reviewed. Uh, yeah, but if you're all interested, just come look for Film Film Network and we can see, uh, we can uh, share with you what we have in our archive. Lah. But I think before we end, uh, maybe I just want to hear a bit from the young people, what do you all think, you know, and how, what, what you're going back with today. You know, uh, you know, we've heard, yeah. Is that possible? Anything that you like, uh, just an ending thing? You know, how you felt about today? Anybody? Left or right? Nadira has spoken. Anybody else? Nadira, do you see me? Anything. What's your impression of today? What are you going back with? One word? One word? Yeah, one word, yes. Huh? Um, uh, because I think, sorry, 
I rasa documentary is too old school way. Kita boleh like do it on TikTok, do it on Instagram. Like tadi uh, saudari cakap uh, dekat sana ada internet, ada handphone. Jadi kita uh, mencari mencari local local uh, art celebrity, local people yang ada connection ada account TikTok something maybe new way beside documentary sorry i okay tiba kena suruh good good but at least yeah. you are starting to think there is other ways uh, uh, yeah, to uh, spread the message documentary to lagi pun only today dekat uh-huh. sini saya nampak dokument tu mm b40 tak tahu pun cerita ni ya yeah. kan lagi ramai majority is b40 not uh-huh. t20 so <coughs> sorry i i Okay, thank you so much. I never is. Ah, tak ada tapi thank you. Thank you. Yay. Good idea. Ada orang lagi? You not young? <laughs> huh? Um it has been what moved me if i can share is the what's going on globally and i don't think we should separate the issues and i don't think we should put one issue over another issue but for me personally i'm going to carry that spirit because this is my people also anywhere in the world being oppressed are my people and i think we should go with the mindset i don't know if there's sense of bitterness or resentment who am i to talk about that right but about about our people but i feel like for us that witnessing this right in this such privilege thank god for that right um to challenge our limiting beliefs about okay if i can have empathy for one group this is for me right why can't i have the same empathy uh for another human being right so i'm sorry my sisters i'm getting all of you too late getting to know but i'm glad that we are here and i feel like that's the spirit and education i feel being malaysians we do carry i not, not just malaysians people in general right americans have proved that sorry <laughs> i mean like what i'm saying is challenge our sentiment lah i think educational route is very important we know what we're supporting Okay because I think um if we do carry that sentiment right I'm not saying it's right or wrong but the foundation wouldn't be too strong right I think TikTok is good idea as long as we can get all this information out and I'm really hope Malaysia this is the turning point for us um I'm millennial I'm going to cheering you guys <laughs> from the back side <laughs> but I'm going to hopefully yeah this is uh, one of the ways to participate and I really hope we become critical thinkers and thank you so much for this space and I think a lot of us macam boleh ke nak cakap macam yang social media right like if I see this government is not doing what's good right they still fear but now I feel like you know what if I have facts as you said um go ahead and speak about it um thank you so much for this space and for everyone for being your sisters ah juga juga encik juga <laughs> yeah, thank you <laughs> I yeah I was a support man okay yeah. any last word maybe huh Uh, okay, saya rasa saya banyak bercakap dari tadi Tapi saya nak cakap lah sebab saya rasa penting untuk semua orang dengar lah um, Bila bercakap tentang uh, isu hari ni Mungkin ramai yang baru tahu dan untuk saya Benda ni dah memang alami Sejak dari kecil lah okay. So uh, isu ni walaupun daripada generasi yang lama Sampai lah kita orang yang generasi Terkini pun rasa macam kadang-kadang hopeless rasa macam benda tu kita orang akan hadapi dan uh, just ya yeah, apa yang setiap daripada kita boleh buat adalah um, kolektif kami usaha untuk kita orang buat something yang uh, walaupun macam tak membantu untuk push isu tapi saya rasa penting untuk uh, orang muda belia-belia muda untuk terus dokumen, dokumen lah orang punya identiti kalau tak sampai sampai bila akan senyap orang tak akan tahu so itu yang apa kata tengah buat apa kata wanita orang sendiri tengah buat kami um, banyak uh, train uh, banyak lebih banyak belia wanita terutamanya uh, belia wanita orang asli lah untuk belajar guna phone buat video sikit pun saya 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 teringat uh, salah satu kata-kata dari Prakash dari witness dia kata korang sekarang boleh guna phone dan 
just record je uh, hari ni saya buat apa hari ni saya uh, cari ubi untuk makanan sehari-harian saya tu je dah cukup dah sebenarnya record satu uh, kehidupan seharian as community orang asli pun dah cukup sama dengan community orang asal lah so ya yeah, saya rasa tu satu perubahan yang kami dah mula buat dan sebenarnya everyone ada peranan dia masing-masing kita as Malaysian kena care lah one another Ya, yeah, just ambil tahu lah apa isu kenal dan jangan jangan ignore lah. Ya, yeah, itu je. Thank you, Lena. Gem nak cakap apa apa? Nak cakap apa apa? Oh, okay, sekejap. <laughs> okay, terima kasih buat uh, semua yang sudi datang lah hari ini. Uh, selalu ingat lah lepas ni. Apa yang kami perjuangkan ni bukan untuk uh, mengekalkan cara hidup kuno tapi ia lebih kepada uh, perkara yang dibuat oleh kerajaan cuma kerajaan ni dia bertindak atas alasan politik kononnya nak membasmi kemiskinan kononnya nak mengelak penjerahan luar bandar ke bandar ini kata-kata dia tapi kita ni betul-betul buat tapi dia tak suka. Ha, di sini masalah berlaku. Kita pun orang Sarawak, rakyat Malaysia juga. Pembangunan tu untuk siapa? Macam kerajaan negeri Sarawak. Dia kata pembangunan-pembangunan untuk siapa? Sebab kita tak pernah merasai nikmat pembangunan tu. Nah, ini yang korang kena faham. Kita bukan melawan ikut naratif dia anti pembangunan. Tak. Kita melawan supaya kita menjadi sebahagian dari pembangunan itu. Ha, itu saja. Terima kasih. Yeah. So, uh, yeah, with that, uh, Citu, can I invite Citu to come back? Thanks, Anna. Um, terima kasih, Gabe. Terima kasih, Suren. Um, so, yeah, we have come to the end of our program today. Um, on behalf of Yaham Gallery, we really would like to thank Freedom Film Network for having put together this. I can only say as an extremely inspirational and empowering day of film programming. Um, I, I think all of us would leave today um, feeling a bit different about what's going on in the world today. And personally, for me, like I'm, 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 I'm quite moved myself. And and you know, it's just a bit odd to have this Freedom Film Festival feeling here in Ilham Gallery. <laughs> <laughs> just brings back old times, which is great. So yeah, thank you so much for being here. Um, like I say, you know, like a lot of um, this, today's program was very much inspired by um, the works of. Nim I mean, the putting together of today's programs was pretty much inspired by the works of Nimala Dad, um, who we are showing upstairs on level five. So before you leave, um, do do you know visit our gallery on level five and have a look at the exhibition. And yeah, thank you very much. Thank you.